Oh, you need to adjust it down a little bit. You can still see the preacher. <laughs> <laughs> We're good to see you this morning. And, uh, glad you're here today. And Loretta just sang, if that doesn't love, a beautiful, beautiful song. And this morning I'm going to be preaching on evangelism. Uh, and the title of the message is Aggressive Slash Patient Evangelism. And you may say, well, what do you mean aggressive evangelism? Is that, are you talking about being aggressive in our evangelism? Or, or are you talking about being patient in our evangelism? Well, this morning, I'm going to preach on both. I'm, I'm going to preach on the fact that we need to be aggressive in evangelism and witnessing to the lost. And I'm going to be preaching on the fact that we there's a time during our evangelism that we definitely need to be very patient and wait on the Lord. So it's an interesting, uh, interesting play on words and it's an interesting study this morning we're going to do. This past week I had a, an experience in, in doing evangelism. I, I got a call and, and then I got an email from, well I got an email from Steve Flegel on Tuesday uh, telling me about the person that he was speaking of. Now, for those of you that may not know, Steve Flegel is my friend. Uh, he runs Flegel Funeral Home and he puts dead people into the ground for a living. He is a mortician. And he's one of the coolest morticians that there could be. He's a really good looking guy. And he's the only man that I know that's got better looking teeth than Joel Osteen. Now, he still can't touch Joel's hair. Uh, Joel's still got it beat with the hair. But, uh, and also those that might be listening by tape, uh, that was a joke. I'm not a fan of Joel Osteen or his theology. But uh, Steve Flegel is my friend, he's my buddy. And sometimes he will call me to come and perform a funeral when there's uh, a, a person who's died that they were so mean and so evil that they never went to church and they don't even have a pastor that they can call. So I usually get the really hard nose lost congregations to share the gospel with during those kind of funerals. But this week it was different. I, I did the funeral last year of, of a lady whose name was Miss Clark. And we went way over to Elk, Elk Ridge uh, near Glen Burnie uh, to, do, to do that funeral. And this particular funeral was the funeral of her mother who just passed away, uh, Miss Clark Sr. And so it was, a, it, was a, it was a bittersweet time. It was a time of, of renewing uh, my relationship with that family. But on both occasions, it wasn't a pleasant trip to make. It wasn't that we were going to the ball game together. It wasn't that we were having a cookout together. But once again, it was me and that family during the worst period of their life when they've lost their mother. She had a rich, full life. She was 95 years old when she died. So Steve and I drove over, and I got to drive with him. We didn't have any funeral home. We went all the way to Elk Ridge and did the whole service there. And we spent the better part of the day together. We, we really had a good time. And, I enjoyed renewing my friendship with Steve. We've just always been good buddies. And I, I preached the message to that little family sitting there. And I never get used to funerals. I, I, I never get used to, to seeing the family suffering and in pain over the loss of a loved one. And sometimes the situation that I'm put in, although I'm appreciative of it, 
when I preach a freedom for someone that I don't know personally, it's hard to really be personal and 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 talk about the the deceased in a way that can really identify with the family. And so I just told the folks, I said, listen, I do not know Mrs. Clark. I don't have a relationship with her. So I'm just primarily going to preach scripture today at the funeral. And they all said, that'd be fine. But as all funerals seem to to exhibit, there was a time that you can have a chance to witness to those who are listening to you. And I never try to take advantage of that. I know preachers, when they find people that are suffering like that, and they're, they're grieving like that, they will pounce on them and they will say, well, these people are emotionally upset, they're weak, they're vulnerable, so I'm going to save them today. Well, we don't save anybody. And that's the difference between evangelism, which is very shallow, and worldly evangelism, and manipulative evangelism, and being aggressive yet patient in evangelism. So I always try to choose my words very carefully. And I've told you before, I know preachers who, who've actually went around and talked to people and told them they're saved during the funeral and, and, and they didn't have a clue as to whether those folks were saved or not. And the reason they didn't have a clue is because they did not have good theology. They think they saved the people. And we know that God is the one that has to save a sinner. And so as I got near the end of the message, I, I took the opportunity to to say something like this. I just simply said, if you folks are not right with the Lord, and if your soul is not ready to meet God, then you need to really pray hard about getting right with God. And get into a lot of theology, but I really want to share that they need to get their hearts right with God. Now, I know that there are those who are reformed like we are and are preached the doctrines of grace who get into a habit of, of losing a desire to witness to the laws. The churches that, that get to the point that they say, well, God's going to save the people regardless, so we don't have to do anything. Well, that, that is not good theology. Uh, what the enemies of Calvinism would say is that that is hyper-Calvinist. We are not hyper-Calvinist here. We are, some of us are hyper, but we're not hyper-Calvinist. And so we believe that we should witness to the laws. We believe it's our responsibility to witness to the laws. Jesus tells us that we should witness to the laws. And so we can't expect God in every scenario just to come down and touch people and save them by himself. He has done that. And he will do that continuously. But there are other scenarios where he uses a means in order to accomplish an end. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that God has a means by which he will bring to pass that which he's already decreed to happen. Every person in our congregation this morning, uh, probably with the exception of Brother Ben, who God did strike them in a place where he shouldn't have been when he was lost and living from the devil, and made him, just struck him and laid him down in the corner until he slid down the wall and cried out to God. And he knew it was God that was speaking to him, which tells me that the Holy Spirit put that in his heart because he certainly did not know God before. 
God chose to save Henrietta the same way she was browbeat as she was uh, forced to come down the aisle, almost, almost physically forced by the, the pastor that she was sitting under at that time. And she finally went down the aisle because everybody was bugging her to death. And she went back up the aisle the same way that she came down the aisle because nothing happened to her soul. You cannot manipulate a person into the kingdom of God. Amen. What God chose to do was sitting in this choir loft behind me one night near the end of the Wednesday night choir rehearsal. Everybody got up to leave and the Holy Spirit of God came upon Henrietta and touched her and she got by her head right there and felt a terrible conviction of her sin and how filthy she was and how dirty she was before God and, and, and she started crying and, and, and the Holy Spirit moved upon her and, and, and she confessed her sins and, and asked God to have mercy upon her and say but God doesn't always act that way most of the time, God will use the preaching of the gospel to convict a person and bring them to the knowledge of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Other times, God will use someone who is witnessing to a lost person and use that as a catalyst to bring that person to the knowledge of Jesus Christ by regenerating. Now does that mean the soul winner, the witnesser, whatever you want to call the person, does that mean he had a part in the regeneration of that sinner? Absolutely not. He had nothing to do with it, but he was being obedient to God as the Holy Spirit inside of that person led them to witness to someone at a specific time and a specific place. That's all right to do that. You know, because we know that God saves doesn't mean that we get a, a buy or a pass and we're no longer responsible to witness to the lost. We will be, as Christians, responsible to witness to the lost as long as we live on the face of this earth. And it's the way God chose to do it. It's the way that, that God set it up. And I think that if there's any doubt, I know Comrade in Bayway, who's pastor in Zambia, who came to our church a couple of years ago. When Conrad became reformed and started the church, everybody told him, well, you can't do that. If you, if you believe that way, you'll, you'll never see people saved and your people won't witness. And Conrad has over 400 people in his church, I know, two years ago. I don't know how many he has now. And I would say, knowing Conrad, that the majority of those people, if not all, are regenerate people. But he said they decided when they started the church that they would have a, a quite hot, aggressive evangelism. Now, aggressive can mean a lot of things. It's not going out and making somebody be saved. But it is actively being aware every day to the fact that God may bring a person into your life that in a subtle way or in a more deliberate way and a more substantial way, you should witness to that person about Jesus. Now, I will read this morning from Acts, the sixth chapter, uh, beginning with, with verse 9, if you leave it there. I want us to look at Stephen and I want us to see what God has to say about him. 6th chapter, 9th verse. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of Libertines, Ceridians, Alexandrians, and them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. You see, he was speaking to them. He was witnessing to them. 
They did not see him as witnessing to them. They saw him as their enemy sticking his nose into their business of sin. And then in verse 11, then they stubborn, these stubborn men which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. What they did, it was witnessing to them. And, and they began to lie about him to other people and say falsehoods which were not true. Now, if we go back to earlier in that chapter, and we see the beginning back in, I don't know, chapter 4 or 5, somewhere way back there, Stephen had begun a sermon. And when those guys preached a sermon, it was probably a long sermon. Because even Paul, or Peter, they all seemed to go back and start with the creation and before the foundation of the world and, and preach to the whole Old Testament and then they got to Jesus. And Stephen had just had one of these marathon sermons where they started with Abraham and he, he reminded the Jews of all the heritage and, and then he, he did fine and nobody said a word till he got to the point that he started talking about Jesus. <coughs> Every time you talk about Jesus, you're going to see a transformation in the lost person that you're talking about. All of a sudden, everything changes. The conversation is going in a different direction, and a lot of times those people are beginning to back out of the conversation and back away from you. But does that mean we're not supposed to talk about Jesus? God forbid what greater thing can we talk about than our Lord? To lost, to save, to anyone. You know, people get convicted sometimes and we don't even know they are. I, I, we went by Greensboro Restaurant after we got through with the funeral, me and Steve Flegel. And uh, the manager, who was the manager there, I, I wanted to meet the undertaker mortician and so we uh, we went by and, and, and we said now I want to tell you about something if, if you want to watch something humorous you need to watch what happens to people in a restaurant when a preacher and a mortician walks in the door you talk about backing off you talk about getting up out of the pew, the, the seat, and, and moving to another table. Well, when the preacher and the mortician walked in, and him with his big Joel Osteen smile on his face, like, huh, we're going to come to make a collection. <laughs> we saw some action. Everybody moved in the back room. We had the whole place to ourselves. But Brother Glenn, the manager of the Greensboro restaurant, he wasn't afraid. He, he kind of timidly peeked his head out of the back door and said, Hey, Bob, but he didn't come out there where we were. He wasn't getting close to a mortician and a pastor. He, he just said, hey, how you doing? He closed the door back. He did come out three, three minutes, but he got out. But it's amazing. They look at you and they say, well, death has come for me. There's a mortician. And he's already got the preacher ready to preach my funeral. Now, which one of us are they coming after so I learned yesterday, the other day, that I'm never going to eat with another mortician. It just ruins your whole day. But it, it was a humorous situation. But in chapter 7, look what happened. Let's follow up and see what happened in chapter 7. Beginning with verse 51. 751. It's a long chapter. Uh, beginning with verse 51. After... After he preached this sermon, he's getting near the end of it. Finally, over here in chapter 7, he's about to close this sermon out. And he, he says, Ye stiff necks and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. He tells them straight out, You've been told about the Lord, and all of your people through your history has been told about your Lord, and yet you resist the Holy Ghost when he comes to you. And, and anything about the Lord that is preached, you resist it. People do that every day. When we witness to them, they resist. When we preach to a lost person, many times they resist. 
because they do not want to be saved. 52 says, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of, of the just one, of whom ye now have been betrayers and murderers. That really cut them to the bone. He told them. He said, you Jewish people, the leadership, the religious people, have been betrayers of Christ and you murdered the God of glory. You have received the law of the disposition of angels and have not kept it. So even angels have been involved in giving you the law. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up and said, Fastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. Can you imagine that? Uh, what a scene. Stephen looks up and sees Jesus standing with God. And when he said that, they said, you're blasphemous. And they stopped their ears, put their fingers in their ears, maybe, and didn't want really to hear it. And they ran to him, and they picked him up, and they took him to prison. People have vicious reactions against Jesus sometimes. And because you represent Jesus, sometimes when you talk to people about Jesus, they're going to have vicious reactions against you. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he went on to be with the Lord. We've talked about this a lot, especially Brother Ken, about the fact that this was aggressive evangelism by Stephen. He came, he preached, he preached hard, he told them what they were, they were murderers, and he, he preached Jesus. He even saw Jesus, the Bible says. But they did not want to hear it. And God took him on. That was the aggressive part of Stephen's evangelism. Now the patient part, aggressive, patient evangelism, was that he did not have an invitation before he died. He, did not, he didn't press them for a, quote, decision, whatever that is. He didn't try to make them come down the aisle. He didn't try to make them say, yes, I, I repeat these words and I'm saved. He did none of that. He just died. But he had already been aggressive in his evangelism by preaching the gospel and telling the truth. Just because a preacher, listen to me, just because a preacher preaches an evangelistic sermon does not mean that that preacher has the responsibility or the authority to close that sermon and save a person's soul. Amen. Once a preacher's preached the gospel, once he's told them about Jesus, once you've witnessed to a person you told them about Jesus, the aggressive part of evangelism comes to an abrupt halt because nowhere in the scripture does it say that a preacher or a Christian has the authority to save a human soul. Somebody needs to tell that to the entire Southern Baptist Convention, the things I've seen in my lifetime.
the patient part of evangelism kicked in. It was God who was being patient. Stephen had done his job, but he was dead. But even though he was dead, and he couldn't save anybody, that may have been the best part of the whole story. Because if he had gone ahead and tried to muddle in the Holy Spirit's business and tried himself to save those people, nobody would have been saved because Stephen was not authorized to save a soul. It's all right for us to talk to people about Jesus. It's all right for us to invite people to church. It's all right for us to live before them a Christian life. We should be doing that. And a church that loses that evangelistic fervor and responsibility, it's not a good thing. Now, I have every confidence that our people know that they can't save anyone. And they're not going to abuse that privilege of witnessing. But I think if there's anything that we need to do is we need to do more witnessing. Is it discouraging? Yes. Is it discouraging to talk to people about the Lord every week and, and nobody shows up? Yes. Does that mean we're supposed to stop and give up? No. The patient part of evangelism is what we need to be aware of. We should be aggressive in witnessing to people. Now, by being aggressive, I'm not saying that we should win them and save them, but we should make a witness to them aggressively without crossing that line and taking over the Holy Spirit's job. And once we witness to them, once we pray for them, once we live before them, then we can relax and be patient and wait on the Holy Spirit to do His work of salvation. We must never be patient at the front end and just wait for God to save somebody. That's just not the way God ordained it in the Scripture. He always uses man and woman to have a little tiny part in salvation, and that part is a proclamation of the gospel. It's the way he wanted to do it. Or else he would not have created preachers. Or else he would not have said, uh, they wait, they need preachers, there's no one to go preach, and the, and the preacher will go, but there's nobody to send them. He does use us to a certain small extent. Well, Stephen died when I opened the song. Because Stephen made an aggressive witness and did a necessity, he had to be patient because he was dead in the ground. God did not choose to save Saul, quote Paul. That is. What happened? And I'm like Ken, I think that Stephen was definitely a catalyst that God used in the salvation of Saul. It says the very next verse, after he said in, in verse 60, you go to 81, and Saul was consenting unto his death. Listen, Saul, about to be Paul, was there consenting, probably cheering, maybe covering only his cloak or whatever. But he was all for the stoning of Stephen, the killing of Stephen. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and heading men and women, and women, committing them to prison. 
Now listen. You say, well, Stephen had an aggressive evangelism, but it didn't do Paul any good. Not yet. Because that was Stephen's part. God's part, the Holy Spirit's part, was to take what Stephen had said, being led by the Holy Spirit, and to implant it in the heart of Saul and begin to convict him. We have no way of knowing when regeneration took place in Paul, which is the first step in salvation. It's when God opens our eyes that we can even see that we are sinners. We don't know whether it will all happen on the road to Damascus. We don't know whether Paul had been under conviction for one, two, three, four, five years. We don't know whether this regeneration took place somewhere after these verses were written. But we know that it did not happen instantly. God does not believe in instant evangelism. He does it sometimes. He doesn't do it all the time. Paul, he did not do at one time. Instead of being saved and coming down the aisle and making a decision, he made a decision. He made a decision, all right. His decision was that he was going to do everything in his power to make sure that Stephen died that day. And then Paul made another decision. Did that save him? No, his next decision was that he would go throughout the province and haul men and women to prison because they were Christians. So he wasn't saved instantly. God, in his case, used patient evangelism until the time that God, in his time, on his terms, was ready to save Saul and rename Paul. Patient evangelism. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Verse 5, verse 6, and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles he did. Then we go on about Philip going, being sent by God to the Ethiopian eunuch, eunuch and being sent into the desert. God had already prepared and been working in the heart of the, of the Ethiopian eunuch. And when he, he saw that it was time to be saved and to be baptized, it says he ran. He ran with haste. God had already been working before because he was reading from the book of Isaiah when Philip got there. Philip didn't save the unit. God saved the unit. But if God does not want to use us in evangelism, why would he take Philip in, from going into a different continent and directly deliver him from a great revival and send him down in the devil and in the desert to witness to one man? That is the problem of God. If he doesn't want us to witness, why did he do that? In his providence, in his decree, he sent Philip to the eunuch in the desert because that's the way that God chose to save the eunuch. God is not a cookie-cutter God. He doesn't do evangelism in a cookie-cutter fashion, but he does it like he does everything else that he does in his own time, in his own way, with each individual people. So you can't outline some little formula and say everybody's going to be saved at 11.59 on Sunday morning. As I love to say. God will save people when he gets good and ready to save them. He will use us sometimes 
And I think more often than not, to preach to someone or witness to someone, and I might dare say even when Loretta sings and, 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 and those songs or scriptural songs which she sings, that God certainly uses that as well. So, beloved, let me just close with this. There's a lot of people out there that need the Lord. And there's a lot of our family and friends that need to be saved. Pray that God will give us wisdom as to how we deal with them. I, I would think that God will work differently in every person that we love in their life. But don't be afraid to witness to them. Don't be afraid to tell them about Jesus. Because God just may use your words. <clears throat> Brother Ben walked into a guy's house and talked to him and never put pressure on him at all. But the guy knew he was a Christian. And I guarantee you while Ben was talking to the guy, he was thinking about the Lord Jesus. It would have been all right if Ben would have said, hey, I'm going to tell you about Jesus. He died on the cross. He died for you. Uh, but don't say it. God used that. And when he went to the funeral, the wife said, thank you for what you've done for my husband. Ben said, I didn't do anything. And Ben was right. It was God that used him, and God did the work. May we continue to witness. I've got a lot of people in my heart. I spent a good bit of time this week with one of those people. And I still pray that God would be merciful and save that person. As, as well as a hundred more I can think of. So let's never lose our burden for the loss. And let's never, never lose the fact that we're responsible to witness to those lost people in whichever way the Holy Spirit leads us to share with them. I want us to have our closing prayer I would like the manager of the Greensboro restaurant to lead us in that prayer this morning. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for the service today, Lord. Lord, I just pray that it touches our hearts, Lord, and just lead us to, to go out and evangelize, Lord, and to, to do it with wisdom, Lord, and know that you're in control, Lord, and that you're in charge. I pray that you burden our hearts, Lord, to the lost and the loved ones. I pray, Lord, that you will be done, Lord, and they will be glorified in all faith. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.